and, e and I, I was able to go through while this family stared at me, you know, and was like, take us with you, and they were not allowed in. So what you have is these Egyptian guards. Unfortunately, Egypt is very complicit in this, um, in this blockade, in this siege um, on Palestine. And you have Egyptian guards who are surrounding them, surrounding this family, holding hands, not letting the family, you know, making sure that the family will not escape into Gaza, into back into their homes. So this is, this hermetic blockade ma is maintained. It's almost three years old at this point. Um, unfortunately, and it really is very debilitating. Um, there's very, very little that is allowed into Gaza. Uh, there were actually the BBC released a list a few days ago that just shows 20 items. It was like 20 or 21 items of, of what is allowed into Gaza. So, for example, um, I'm trying to remember what was on the list. Um, I, it was like they're allowed to have uh, um, flour, but they're not allowed to have jam. You know, they're allowed to have, they're not allowed to have toys, toys are not allowed in. Definitely no re rebuilding materials, so no... Human. Human is not allowed. Human, yeah, different types of spices. I mean, if you have 20, imagine 21 things that are permissible. Mm -hmm. How many things do we have? Within a few minutes we use tw at least 21 things. Mm -hmm. So, um, 21 things are allowed into Gaza permissibly. And so, until now, it's been over a year since this offensive, which actually literally demolished the civil infrastructure of Gaza, even though the civil in civilian infrastructure was almost demolished beforehand. It literally demolished the civilian infrastructure. Till now, cement is not allowed in, glass is not allowed in, no rebuilding tools are allowed in. And when I went in, Mar I went in February, um, and then I went again in J July, six months later, Nothing had changed. Nothing had changed. There was no. There was not a single house that was rebuilt for the six months um, that I was not there. So the situation in Gaza is actually really. Uh, it's on the brink of a humanitarian crisis, and unfortunately, um, the international world is kind of just watching and not letting anything happen. Even though there's been millions and millions and almost billions of dollars have been allotted to go to Gaza to help rebuild it, that money has not been allowed in because, again, of the blockade, because of the siege. And one thing that people in Gaza will tell you is that as horrible as those 22 days, imagine 22 days where you have constant bombardment by the Israeli, Israeli military, Israeli troops, and nobody was allowed to flee, which is, you know, I'm not even going to talk about international law in this, but that's obviously against international law. Nobody was allowed to flee except for 200 foreign wives that were allowed to flee. So they were stuck within this little strip of land, 22 days. And they saw, you know, white phosphorus again dying, all this, you know, flechettes, all this type of military artillery. They still say that the worst thing to hit Gaza is a siege. It's actually not even the military brute force that Israel has used against um, against Gaza. So, so this is this is the reality of Gaza. Um, this is the wall uh, that separates Gaza from Egypt. And one interesting thing, though, I have to say about Gaza that's very, very different than the West Bank, than Jerusalem, um, and then and 1948 uh, regions, is that in Gaza you do not see Israelis at all. You don't see them. You, you see them, you know, if you're driving on the road, you'll see the Navy ship from a couple of miles away in the ocean. You'll hear them over, over, overhead, the, the, you know, the drones and, and the helicopters, but you won't actually ever see them. There's no checkpoints. There's, um, there's no face-to-face inter -face interaction with Israeli soldiers, as opposed to the West Bank, which is a constant, where the Israeli soldiers, and, and that interaction is a constant and daily reality for Palestinians. This is actually, again, these are all pictures that I took. Um, this is, I call this the second, when I went to Gaza, it was like the second Nakba. And again, Nakba was the 19, it was a, it's called the catastrophe in 1948, where you had 700 to 900,000 Palestinians who fled as refugees. In Gaza, what you see is kind of a second Nakba, where you have people who are already refugees, who have become refugees again because of the military assault um, on, on Gaza. Oops. And so you have people living in these tents. Um, who, who have, their houses have been demolished, have been destroyed, and now again they live in the tents. Very similar, and very similar pictures to what you saw back in 1948 when you have Palestinians fleeing from their homes because of the creation of the State of Israel. 
Um, and it's really interesting, actually. I interviewed a few people. And one of the very, a very famous picture that you'll see when you look, you start looking at historically uh, the Palestinian conflict is women with keys around their neck, which is the keys to their houses. You see the very same thing now when you go to Gaza. Women will have their keys around their neck as necklaces because they've lost their homes. So that's the experience of Gaza. Um, I, I'm going to go on to the next areas um, and because each area is very different in the way that they have experienced occupation, the way that they've experienced Israeli occupation, Israeli apartheid. Um, but I wanted to see if you actually had any questions about Gaza before I head out, head into the West Bank. I have a question that kind of relates to both. Okay. I think that the responses um, by the Palestinians in West Bank and Gaza were very different. And I don't know if we talked about this or if you're going to cover it. But I was really curious what led to the different responses there. And also, well, just what led up to the differences in how everybody interacted in those two areas. I don't think I understand your question. Responses to what? Well, because there's uh, like more of the fighting and violence in Gaza, right? There's more fighting and violence? Yeah, well, at least that's what I've heard. Mm, I mean, not, I don't think necessarily. I think it's a, di it's a different reality um, than the West Bank. Um, I, mean, I, I, I don't think I understand the other question. What, what exactly is it more fighting and violence vis-a-vis -vis Israel, like the responses against the Israeli occupation? Yeah. Well, again, um, Gaza, in 2005, Israel pulled out of Gaza, right? There was, um, so you don't have any direct contact with Israeli state. And so basically, it's kind of like they're, it's like a prison. It's an open air prison <laughs> where you can't, you're not actually, you have, you can't go and try to apply for building permits or whatever. There's, it's not an active occupying force within Gaza. Whereas in the West Bank, it's very active. It's like there's checkpoints, there's you know military installments everywhere. You can't move three feet without having to deal with a, an Israeli soldier. And so it's a very different, you know, it's not, you don't have that interaction in Gaza. And so unfortunately, for the, the problem with Gaza is that they're stuck in this ghetto where they have policies imposed on them, but they have no way of responding or no way of, of dealing, you know, they can't lodge a complaint because who are they gonna lodge a complaint to? They have no ability to interact with the people who are putting them in this situation. For example, the siege, which is three years long, there, you as a Gazan have no voice. You can't get through to Israel because you're stuck in this prison, basically. It's like, imagine being in a prison and trying to get to the prison's administration. You can't, you're stuck behind bars. And so, that's really the fundamental difference uh, where you have, you know, you have in one place, it's kind of like there, this prison that's, that's on the side and you can't, you can't communicate, you're, you're, you're isolated from the rest of the world. Whereas the West Bank, it's, it's very isolating, it's, it's, you know, like their movement is still very restricted, but there's, there's actual, it's an, it's an active occupation. What led to the um, Israel pulling out of Gaza? Um, I mean, I think it was a lot of things. It was, it was a strategic thing for Israel. Um, they had removed about 8,500 settlers from Gaza because they were trying to, to, trying to build, you know, an image of, you know, they're, they're trying to support peace and whatnot. But while they pull out, they pulled out 8,500 settlers in Gaza, they placed, I don't remember exactly how many, almost twice or three times in the West Bank. Um, and so, and also it was because there was a lot of, there was a lot of problems in Gaza for Israeli. It was very hard to control the Gazan people because they were, you know, they were, they, they did resist the occupation. Um, so, it, I mean, there was a, a whole bunch of factors, but a lot of it was PR for Israel. Like they wanted to show, they wanted to show that they were actually doing something. They were, um, they were actually, you know, engaging this peace process, but unfortunately it was a limited peace process because they were taking people out of here and just putting them over there. So, 